let's start. Thank you very much for uh, coming to the last lecture. So it will be almost independent of everything we did so far. We are going to study large dimensions. So lecture four, separating walk in dimension d larger than four. I want essentially to be, uh, I mean, to do two things. The first one I want without uh, explaining the assumption, I want to explain how from the bubble condition that I will define in a minute, uh, you can derive some information on the self holding walk. And basically what I will prove is that in average, Cn is like mu C to the n. There is no correcting factor. Then I will explain in the second part, I will uh, explain the less expansion and I will not do everything, but try to give you an idea of what is uh, the basic, uh, I mean, basic principle. Okay, so first section, applications. Of the bubble condition. So since there will be um, several, uh, I mean, we are going to look at the green function a lot during this lecture, I'm just going to change a little bit the notation. I will call zx the partition function of the following walk and the generating function. Okay, so the x, the parameter x will be in index. And I will define gx of u to be, if you want, the green function of the self owning walk at the vertex u. So x is uh, just a positive number. gx of u is the sum over every walk from 0 to u of x to the length of the walk. Okay, so here u is a vertex in zd. So I will try not to be confused between the x, which is a parameter, and the u, which is a vertex. If I am, please uh, tell me quickly. Okay? Very good. So our goal is to, to try to derive information on the self holding walk when you make the following assumption. So bubble condition. So the bubble condition is the following. You assume that sum over every u in zd of gx critical of u. So remember that here there is a radius of convergence, which is xc, which is 1 over the connected constant. So here, I assume that when I sum over every vertex the green function of the self holding walk, but I square it, then I have something finite. Notice that the square is very important. If you just do that, this is just z of xc, and we saw that z of xc was infinite. So you need to square it. So this will be what we call uh, the bubble condition, and this quantity we will call it bubble x. Okay, so the assumption is that this is finite. Okay, just a remark. We will see, uh, or you could deduce basically that if you assume this, uh, this thing, you can deduce that in fact g x of u should behave like this green function, the simple random walk green function. So if bubble condition is, is valid, then one expects whether you can actually prove it is something else, but one definitely expects that g x c of u behave like the green function, which I would define like that, green function for random walk of u, which is by definition the expectation for a random walk starting at 0 of the sum 
for n equals 0 to infinity of indicator function that xn equal u. So it's the expected number of visits to u starting from 0. Okay? And the point is that this quantity behaves like constant divided by u to the d minus 2. Why do I tell you that? Because if you assume that the bubble diagram condition is valid, then you get that the green function is behaving like that. Well, when I retune this here, I should get something finite, right? So if, uh, I mean, but sum for u in zd of constant over u to the d minus 2 is finite if and only if d is strictly larger than 4. So what did I do in this remark? I basically stated the consistency uh, condition that you cannot expect the bubble diagram to be finite below dimension 4. I mean, below dimension far, 5. At dimension 4, there is something else happening. So this has the following important implications. Implication, so bubble condition is not expected to be true if d is smaller or equal to 4. I don't say cannot be true because here this equivalence is a little bit tricky, but definitely everybody expects that it's true. Okay? So everything that I will say when I assume that the bubble diagram is finite is, uh, is only valid for d larger than 4. And notice, notice on the contrary, sorry, that if you have that the green function of the self holding walk is smaller than that, then you have the bubble condition for d larger than 4. So the second part of the talk will actually be to prove that this thing has to be smaller than a constant over u to the d minus 2, okay? Which will give the, the converse. But that's not the, that's not the goal of the first part. The goal of the first part is really to give you one example of application. There are many of them. Yeah? Yes, you are right. If I start making mistakes now, I cannot even tell you what it's going to be when I, we are going to do the less expansion. But anyway. Okay. Okay. So that's that was you know, a remark. So the application I have in mind is to tell you how z is exploding when z approaches the critical point. So we know already. Remember that c n is larger or equal to mu c to the n, right? So that implies automatically that z x is larger or equal to constant, I mean, actually, to xc, or let's say 1, 1 minus x over xc, right? So it explodes at, at least like that. So the next proposition is exactly telling you the opposite. So if bubble xc is finite, then there exists a constant c such that zx is smaller or equal to constant over 1 minus x over x for any x smaller than x. So it's exactly the converse. And notice that this has an immediate corollary. which I'm going to state like that, I'm going to say for any n larger or equal to 0, sum of the ck mu c to the minus k for k equals 0 to n, it's smaller than constant times n, which I can rewrite as the average is smaller than constant. How do you get this corollary? You just apply to x equal 
xc times 1 minus 1 over n. Okay, so this is just a proof here. Just apply to x equal xc 1 minus 1 over n. Notice that then z of this value of x is smaller than constant times n. But for any k smaller or equal to n, 1 minus 1 over n to the k is just a constant, basically. Right? So then you get that sum for k equals 0 to n of ck mu c to the minus k. It's smaller than something like e times uh, uh, z of this x, uh, let's call it xn, which is smaller than x times n. OK? So at least in average, you end up with the fact that, so in average, ck is like constant times mu c to zk. It's only an average statement. If you would like to get really the full statement, which you can definitely do once you know everything about less expansion, then what you need to prove is something a little bit better. So if you would like to have an estimate on Cn, what do you want to get? You want to get a Tauberian theorem, right? So by a Tauberian theorem, one would get ck smaller than constant mu c to the k for every k if, if you would get this, that z of z is smaller or equal to constant over 1 minus z over xc for every z smaller than zc. But here you need it to be complex to be able to apply the Tauberian theorem. Here I'm just proving something for real numbers. Okay? So that's what is missing and actually you can get that, it's just you have to work more. And it would go beyond what I can just ex explain in two hours. So. Uh, but I think already just uh, having the result for almost every n is kind of satisfactory. OK. At least it satisfies me, so that's something. OK, so that was the proof of this corollary, but let's now prove proposition 4.1. So here we are going to do something quite classical in statistical uh, physics. We are going to derive a differential inequality for z. So we want to see z as a function of x and derive a differential inequality. And the differential inequality will be the following. So we wish to prove the following. We wish to prove that x times z prime of x, you understand what I mean by prime here, is for zx seen as a function of x, is larger we call to z of x squared divided by bubble of x minus z of x. So I want this for any x smaller than x. So maybe before I, I prove this differential inequality, let me explain to you how you derive the result from it. So the only thing we are going to do is we are going to integrate this differential inequality between x and x critical. Okay, so let me do it in more uh, details. So I'm going to write it like that. So this means minus z prime x over zx squared is equal to uh, minus, so how will I write it? Uh, sorry. No, sorry. That means this larger way equal to uh, 
1 over x bubble of x minus basically 1 over x zx. Okay? And here I do recognize the derivative of minus 1 over zx. Right? This is the derivative of minus 1 over zx. So that has to be larger than this quantity. Now, notice that bubble of x is always smaller or equal to bubble of xc, right? So here, I can add c like that. I don't get infinity. That's the problem. Otherwise, you, you may get infinity. But here, I don't get infinity. Also, notice that zx itself is going to infinity. That's, for instance, proved here. So I can fix uh, x0, so fix, fix x0 such that z of x0 is larger than, say, twice bubble. OK? Then if you do that here, you end up with larger or equal to 1 over 2x times bubble of xc for any x larger than x0. Right? So I just, I'm just saying there, do not bother too much about this term, okay? which you could have guessed here as well. This zx is going to infinity. This is constant, basically. So here, in fact, I could have ignored this term. Okay? So once you are there, well, you are in good shape because you can just integrate between x and xc. Actually, let's even put xc here. That doesn't change a thing. So here, this is constant. You can integrate, and you end up with 1 over zx minus 1 over z of xc is larger or equal to xc minus x over constant. This is by integrating. between xc, uh, x, and xc. But this is just 0. z of xc is infinity. And I end up with zx small or equal to constant divided by xc minus x, which is exactly what I wanted. OK? Here. Formally, this is true only for x larger than x0. But of course, the only behavior we are interested in is the behavior ne near xc. So this assumption is harmless. OK, so now we need to prove this one. So we need to prove 1. We need to prove this differential inequality. So how do we do that? Let's look at what this guy is. So this guy is sum for any walk ending somewhere of what? So it's a sum of gamma x of gamma, right? It will, should be the derivative is gamma x of gamma minus 1. I multiply by x, I end up with that, which I'm going to write in two terms. I'm going to say it's a sum for any gamma ending somewhere of gamma plus 1 x of gamma minus where the sum of the x of gamma, which is just z of x. So my whole point is I need to prove that this thing is larger than zx squared divided by bubble of x. OK, so call this thing q of x. And we need to prove q 
of x larger or equal to zx squared divided by bubble of x. OK. So q of x, so it's the sum over u of the sum of a gamma going from 0 to u. But the gamma plus 1, notice, is exactly the number of vertices on my walk. So instead of writing gamma plus 1 x of gamma to the power gamma, I'm going to write the sum of a u and the sum of a v of x to the gamma indicate a function that v belongs to gamma. Right? It's the same thing. I'm just counting each walk, the length of the walk. But now observe that the good thing with this writing is that this can be rewritten as sum of two walks, one gamma 1 going from 0 to v, and one gamma 2 going from v to uh, the boundary. So it's a sum of a, uh, to, uh, to u, sorry. Sum of a u and v of the sum of a gamma 1 from 0 to u, uh, to v, gamma 2 from v to u of x to the gamma 1 plus gamma 2, except these two walks, they need to satisfy something very special. They should intersect only at v, because together they need to, make, to give a, um, a safe holding walk. And here is the key of the key of what we are going to do today. It's basically we are going to do that repeatedly. This is a difficult condition to handle. This condition here. It's telling something between the first and the second walk, and it's telling something very non-trivial. But what we are going to do? We are just going to say, okay, this is whole thing is equal to the thing without the condition minus the thing where we force the two to intersect somewhere else than v. So we are going to go by inclusion-exclusion. But the point is that in high dimension, re-intersecting is something that is going to cost us something. That's something that we are going to be able to express. So here, for instance, we are going to write it as this thing, which if you think about it, is just zx squared, because there, there is no condition, the second walk you can integrate out the second walk to get zx, then you integrate out the first one to get zx. And the error term, we are going to bond it in terms of the bubble diagram times zx squared. And that's what is going to help us uh, computing this thing. OK, so let's. I mean, exactly start this program. So the first thing is sum over u and v of x to the gamma 1 plus gamma 2. Sorry. And then we have another term, which is sum over u and v of x to the gamma 1 plus gamma 2. But indicator that gamma 1 intersecting with gamma 2 is different, I mean, contains, and it's different from v. OK? Here, again, you integrate over gamma 2. And uh, this, this was, sorry, uh, sum. I forgot the sum here. And here as well, OK. So <laughs> gamma 1 from 0 to u, gamma 2 from u to v. And here it's the same sum gamma 1 from 0 to u, gamma 2 from, zero, uh, from u to v. So here again, you integrate gamma 2. By invariance of the translation, you get zx. You integrate gamma 1. By invariance of the translation, you get zx. So the first thing is just zx squared. No difficulty there. Now this guy here definitely is smaller than the sum of a u, v, and w in Zd, w not equal to v, of. So what should happen? So if you have 
a walk from 0 to v and a walk from v to, double, to, to u. But this second walk does intersect the first one. Well, it means that there is a W somewhere, which is the last intersection between the two, so the last one. And so this walk needs to do like that. It may intersect several times here, end up at W, and then it needs to go through U without intersecting the first walk, right? But in particular, if you have that, then the beginning of the walk here should not intersect the end of the second walk. So here, what I'm going to say is that this is like having four walks, gamma 1, gamma prime 1, gamma 2, gamma prime 2. So it's the sum of a gamma 1 from 0 to w, gamma prime 1 from w to u, gamma 2 from uh, to v, sorry, gamma 2 from v to w, and gamma prime 2 from w to u, of x to the gamma 1 plus gamma prime 1 plus gamma 2 plus gamma prime 2. I'm going slowly because we are going to redo things, and I'm pretty sure for people who write, it's not that slow, but... Um, and here, among all the... I mean, I have a lot of constraints. This second guy should not intersect gamma prime 1, should not intersect gamma 1, gamma 2 should not intersect gamma prime 2, gamma 2 is allowed to intersect gamma prime 1, but not gamma 1. I mean, it's a little bit complicated. Let's drop most of these conditions and just write indicator function that gamma 1 and gamma prime 2 should have an intersection which is just w. Let's just keep this one. I'm doing an inequality. Anyway, when I was saying I'm intersecting, I'm, I was really summing on w anyway. So I drop most of the constraint and write like that. So again here, to keep in mind, w is uh, last intersection. So we are decomposing with respect to the last intersection. OK. So how do we do now to conclude? Well, notice here that if I fix gamma 1 and gamma prime gamma 1 and gamma prime 2, what do I have? I have gamma prime 1 and gamma 2, which have no condition of intersection with gamma 1 and gamma prime 1. They have no inter nothing. They are just two walks going from W to V. Or let's say one is going from W to V and the other one is a reversal of it. Of one. Okay? So if I sum, if I sum the W, I mean the gamma prime one and gamma and gamma two, I just end up with a green function squared the green function squared of the self holding walk at V minus W. Right? Each one of them contribute that. And then I get x to the gamma 1 plus gamma prime 2. Indicator function of gamma 1 intersection gamma prime 2 is w. Right? So this was q of x, by the way. So q of x is larger or equal to zx squared minus well, the sum of a V of this guy is what? It's just bubble of X 
minus 1, actually, because V must be different from W, so you don't have the contribution from walks from 0 to 0, which are just 1. And then imagine here I erase all the reference to W. So this guy uh, to V, this guy is not there, this guy is not there, this guy is not there. What do I end up with? Well, this is just Q of X. Hence, Q of X is larger or equal to Zx squared divided by bubble. And that's the end of the proof. OK, so it's an inclusion-exclusion principle. At this stage, actually, it doesn't use, I mean, this derivation of the differential inequality does not refer at all to the bubble condition. It involves the bubble uh, of x, but it doesn't, I mean, this is true for any x smaller than xc in any dimension. It's always true. So here there are really two things. There is deriving some differential inequality for z of x, and there is a second step, which is using the bubble condition when you integrate out this differential inequality between x and xc. OK? So that was the first part of, um, of, the, of the day. Now, of course, I mean, this is interesting only if you have a way to prove the bubble condition. And that's going to be what we are going to do in the second part, which is, which is going to be a little bit more like um. Are there questions on this part? So again, use inclusion-exclusion and uh, then use the bubble diagram to integrate out, uh, the bubble condition to integrate. So second part, and uh, I mean biggest part of the, of the lecture, is infrared bound via less expansion. So the goal here, let me maybe state it as a theorem actually. So theorem. which is due to Hara uh, and Slade. Actually, um, since I'm going to prove the weekly self-forwarding group, maybe let me not uh, put any person. So for D large enough, G X C of U, I mean, there exists a constant C such that g x c of u is smaller than constant times, uh, actually we, we are going to prove it's, uh, it's true. So, okay. It's smaller than twice the green function for the simple random walk. And already, I must say, we are not going to prove this theorem. We are going to prove it for a simpler model. But I want to do as much as possible for this model and then explain to you what needs to be adapted. <coughs> OK. So you agree if you have that, you have the bubble condition automatically. OK, so the idea is the following. The idea is not to work really with the green function, but to work with its inverse for the convolution. So let me define the following. So definition uh, for uh, f and g function from Zd to R 
in L2, define f convoluted with g at u to be the sum over v in zd of f of u minus v, g of v, and this for every v in zd. Sorry? What did I do? U minus v. No? Uh, for all u, you're right, sorry. And here, the observation, the first observation, is that G random walk has an inverse and what is the inverse? Just the Laplacian. Denoted Laplacian random walk and defined by Laplacian of u is equal to 1 if u is equal to 0, minus 1 over 2d if u is a neighbor of 0, and 0 otherwise. So by inverse, I mean that I mean, what is a neutral for convolution? It's the Dirac at zero. So by this, I mean G random walk Laplacian is equal to Dirac at zero, right? Which maybe let me write it because anyway, it's going to use it's going to be useful for us. This is equivalent to saying that the green function is equal to the Dirac at zero. Actually, uh, let's write it like that. Or, okay. Plus one over two D sum over U neighbors, I mean, sum over V neighbors of zero of green function at U minus V. Right? It's exactly the same. Just pass this thing on the other side and you recognize the convolution of the green function with Laplacian. Okay? So question. Well, can we get something similar to this equation for, for G, for the green function here? of self avoiding walk. By the way, in this section, I will just drop the x, OK? Because the notations otherwise are going to be way too heavy. So uh, question, similar bound for g of u, which now is, I mean, we drop this, OK? OK, well, let's try. Let's just start and see uh, like, uh, if we can make it look like this, at least. So g of u So now I'm really working with the green function of self avoiding walk. Well, first, if it's equal, if u is equal to 0, then this is 1. So at least we have this thing good for us. And if the u, u is not equal to 0, then there is a first step, right? So it's the sum of a v neighboring 0. I need to do one step, which is going to cost me x. And then I need well, a sum for every gamma from v to u of x to the gamma 
but notice that I also need these walks not to pass again through zero, right? So here I should put indicator function that gamma does not contain zero, right? So I just decompose on the first step of my walk from zero to some v, and then I have a walk going from zero from v to u. If you would remove this condition, well, you will exactly end up with the thing there with x instead of 1 over 2d, right? So what are we going to do? Well, we are going to remove this by saying, OK, this is equal to the thing with this thing minus well, the case where it does go back to 0. So let's write this as delta 0 of u plus x times the sum of a v neighboring 0 of g of u minus v minus x sum for v neighboring 0 of the sum for gamma from v to u and gamma containing 0 of x to the gamma. Okay, so I'm correcting my term and this first term here, I mean this term here, let's call it 1. So the goal it to, uh, is to understand how one looks like, okay? Because these terms actually look great. This looks quite good, I mean, as good as we can wish for, basically. So the game is this guy. Okay, so uh, actually let me include the sign in the, like that. So one, We are going to do exactly like here. So if you are a walk starting from zero, basically, doing one step, then going back to zero, and then going from this to, uh, to v, well, what you can say is that this is minus sum of a one walk from zero to zero, and one walk gamma two from 0 to u. So I'm just using if I reintersect I'm like that, except that these two walks, so x to the gamma 1 plus x to the I mean to the gamma 2, it says that these two walks of course should intersect only at 0. So now we really have something that looks like something like that, and we are exactly going to remove this indicator function and put that it intersects at somewhere else. So this is equal to minus sum gamma 1 from 0 to 0, gamma 2 from 0 to u of x to the gamma 1 plus x to the gamma 2. And then I write plus sum. So now I'm going to go a little bit fa uh, faster and say, well, actually, no, I'm not going to go faster. Sorry about that. So gamma 1 from 0 to 0, gamma 2 from 0 to u, x to the gamma 1 plus gamma 2. We they get a function that gamma 1 intersected with gamma 2 contains somebody, something else than 0. Let me first do this step. OK. So now here, first thing is, let's treat this guy. So this guy is what? It is equal to what I will write the sum for v in zd. And you will understand why I want to write it like that. Of pi 1 of v, uh, actually the blue is maybe not the best color. I mean, it's still reasonable, I think, for now. Oh, okay, let me try with this one. Uh, 
times g of u minus v, where pi 1 of u uh, of v, here is going to be delta 0 of v times, well, times just the sum over every gamma from 0 to 0 of x to gamma. Okay, so I just want, I mean, there is only one term in this sum, which is v equals 0, but you will see it's important to understand the structure of, of these guys. So what I want is to write it like that, and I just want to encode the intersection in this work. So this is one work, and this work has this property. So imagine I put the indexes of the work here, from 0 to length of gamma, like that. Well, here, what are the two only values which have the right to intersect and must intersect? Well, the first value and the last value must be the same. Sorry, it must be the same, I mean. I mean. So I'm just going to encode it by, tha by that. I'm going to say, I'm going to put an edge like that between 0 and gamma to denote the fact that 0 and gamma, I mean, gamma of 0 and gamma of gamma must be equal. Okay? I write it like that. So that's my first term. Now, this thing here, I call it 2, and I'm going to try to treat it the same way. So let's go here. I'm going to do three steps because there are three new behaviors. And I'm going to go, I mean, try to go not too fast, but uh, I'm also not so familiar with all these things. OK, so here, if I intersect, that means that there is a v where you must intersect. So here, uh, something which is a little bit annoying, but I definitely think that here it was better to look at the f f well, actually, I don't know. Um, here, I'm going to actually decompose on the first intersection. So here, I'm going to write it as a sum for gamma 1 from 0 to uh, 0. And I'm going to say, well, the second walk has to go from 0 to some v which belongs to gamma 1. And then gamma 3 goes from v to u. Right? And I write x to the gamma 1 plus gamma 2 plus gamma 3. And here, what is the indicator function? So if I did intersect at v, and if v is my first intersection, I do need that gamma 2 and gamma 1 intersect only at 0 and at uh, v. They cannot intersect anywhere else. But of course, when I'm doing that, I'm forgetting something. What am I forgetting? I'm forgetting that gamma 3 and gamma 2 are the two guys that are coming from gamma 2 here. Maybe I should write them gamma 2, 1 and gamma 2, 2. They are both coming from gamma 2 here. Hence, they also must not intersect. Well, now you understand that I, I don't want to write that. I'm going to say, well, I remove the condition and I subtract the term where they do intersect. So I'm going to end up with minus sum over gamma 1 from 0 to 0, gamma 2, 1 from 0 to v, gamma 2, 2 from v to u, x to the gamma 1 plus gamma 2, 1 plus gamma 2, 2, indicator function of gamma 1 intersected with gamma 2, 1 equal 0, v. But I add the indicator function that gamma 
2, 1 intersected with gamma 2, 2 is not just equal to V, which it should be. Do you agree? I should have here the intersection. I write it as 1 minus, I mean, uh, empty intersection. I write it as 1 minus the fact that it does intersect. OK. So there will be two terms here. There will be our term 3. And I'm sorry for that, but we will go through uh, one last step. So this will be term 3. But before that, I want to understand this term. Because, I mean, I could go directly with the less expansion, but then, I mean, I think there is something a little bit mysterious with what is happening. It works, but... Okay, so this term here, I'm going to write it as sum of a V of pi 2 of V G of U minus V, where... So pi 2 of V now is right. So at the top, notice gamma 2, 2 is now a completely independent work from everything that happened before. So this is going to give me the G of U minus V. And I need to sum of a gamma 1 from 0 to 0 and gamma 2, 1, which I'm going to write gamma 2 from 0 to V, belonging to gamma 1. I mean, all right, I'm going to write it like that. Indicator function. I mean x to the gamma 1 plus gamma 2 indicate a function that gamma 1 intersected with gamma 2 is equal to 0 and v. <coughs> Which, again, if I try to express it like that, gives me what? So let's say this is uh, gamma 1. So here you have gamma 1, and then you, you put gamma 2 next to it. So what do we need? We need gamma 1 to go from 0 to 0. So here, the value of the work here is the same as the value of the work here. So I write these two values must be equal. Now, there is a value here, so this is gamma 2 of v, right? But there is another value here, which is equal to v. Let's say it's this one. So this has gamma 1, I mean, let's say this is k, and you have gamma 1 of k equal v. Well, this one must be equal to this one, to the last one, right? And these are the only two intersections allowed. That means, exactly like here, any two other edges had to be different. Here, any two other edge, you have to have dif uh, different values. OK? Good. Let's do one last step, because something happens when you look at pi 3. And I think after that, you kind of get the phenomenology, and we can go for the general uh, case. So let me not erase this. <coughs> I never promised that would be nice. <laughs> but it's a very powerful uh, technique. And it, it applies to so many models that it's extremely useful, I think, to see in the case of self reading book. Let's do the last step, so three. So three again. We are going to write it as minus sum. So we need now gamma 2, 2. We are going to decompose it into the first intersection with gamma 2, 1, which is going to be W. Okay? So I'm going to end up with minus sum from gamma 1 from 0 to 0, gamma 2, 1 from 0 to V, gamma 2, 2, 1 
from v to w and gamma 2 to 2 from w to u. And I need x to the gamma 1 plus gamma 2, 1 plus gamma 2, 2, 1 plus gamma 2, 2, 2. I did write 1, 2, 3, 4 on my uh, thing. I don't really know why I did that now, but I guess I just panicked. <laughs> gamma 1, gamma 2, 1 is equal to v. Gamma 2, 2, uh, 2, 1, sorry intersected with gamma 2 to 1 equal w. And again, there should be an additional intersection thing, but which is going to appear in a fourth term, which I promise I'm not going to do. OK? But what I wanted to write is that this term, which is now the equivalent of the violet term there, this term is written as the sum over v of pi 3 of v. Uh, my, by the way, I did a very big mistake there. There's a minus here. OK. Sorry? Yeah, in pi 2 of v, there is no delta 0, right? It was really the sum on any vertex in the in the whole bulk, yeah, times g of u minus v, where pi 3 of v is equal to the sum, so gamma, well, well, I mean, gamma 1 from 0 to 0, gamma 2 from 0 to v, gamma 3 from v to w, of x to the gamma 1 plus gamma 2 plus gamma 3. And here I end up with indicators and gamma 1 intersected with gamma 2 is equal v. And gamma 2 intersected with gamma 3 is equal, I mean, to 0 v, sorry. And gamma 2 intersected with gamma 3 is equal to v. Uh, no, what am I doing? Sorry, with W. Okay. Why did I do this step, which doesn't look much nicer than the other one? So I just re rewrote these things right here. I did this step for the following reason. When you encode, let's try to encode again. with this thing. So what do we end up with? So let's say this is gamma 1. Let's say this is gamma 2. And let's say this is gamma 3. OK? So gamma 1 goes from 0 to 0. So this guy needs to be, I mean, are equal. Then, again, the end of gamma 2 needs to be one of these points. So if this guy is k and you have gamma 1 of k equal v, you end up with this thing, right? And then you also have, this is w, but you have a term here, which is l, such that gamma 2 of l is equal to w. And these guys need to be equal like that. So, OK, that looks very much like before. Why did I do this step? I did this step to make you realize one thing, which is that here, I have absolutely no constraints between gamma 1 and gamma 3. So in fact, there, any edge like that could be there. In the sense, you could have intersection between any edge here and any edge here. OK? So this could be an intersection. This could be an intersection, etc., etc. So when I'm going to do the systematic thing, which I'm going to do now, you are going to see that we are going to resum on these edges somehow. OK? So we are going to get 
back to that, but now the question is uh, more explicit. Expansion. Whoa, in one hour. Okay, so that's perfect. And we are at the half of uh, what I wrote, which is really, really amazing. Okay. And there is a minus, which I again forgot, thank you very much, which I'm writing here. Yes, you are entirely right. So we are going to do a five minute break. And then I'm going to explain to you how you do a s generic thing. And it's going to be based on these encodings that I uh, described in these three first examples. And we are going to do it in a generic way. And then there will be a fir um, questions of, of course, you want this pi k, pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, and so on, not to be too big. In some sense, interpret this pi k as long range steps. If you would have only this thing, it's the nearest neighbor random walk. Imagine this pi k as long range steps, except they have one property which is extremely bad for an interpretation as a Markov process which is that they may be negative. And that is going to make it a little bit more difficult to interpret. But morally speaking, it's kind of long range. You are rewriting sefo I mean, the, the green function of sefo as a green function of a long range model, except there is this very big cave height, which is that it's with non-positive weights. So you, we will have to refer to analysis instead of the random walk interpretation to estimate the asymptotic of these things. OK, so break five minutes, and we start at 40. OK, so we want to do a more symmetric, uh, I mean, a more systematic decomposition. And for that, we are going to introduce a little bit what corresponds to these diagrams here. And it's going to come from the following quantity. So defined k of a, b. So it's something defined on integers, and it's a sum. I mean, it's a, sorry, maybe you're going to do that. It's by definition, the product of uh, every s smaller than t, smaller or equal to b, and larger or equal to a. Just think of 0 and the length of the walk, OK? Of 1 plus u s t of gamma. So it's a, a function of gamma. And it's equal to, uh, I mean, where u s t of gamma is minus 1 if gamma s equals gamma t, and 0 otherwise. So imagine, for instance, if you want to check whether a walk is self avoiding or not, you apply k of a, b to the walk, which is at this stage not self avoiding and you agree that if so k uh, 0 gamma of gamma is just 1 if gamma is safe avoiding and 0 otherwise. Just a way of writing the repulsive condition. OK. Now, Observe that this so this quantity can also be rewritten as a sum over gamma, which I will call a graph, and I will tell you what a graph is in a second, of the product over st of u st st in gamma. So let me fix the notations here. So st is just going to be a pair st where s is strictly smaller than t. It's just a short edge, I mean, a short notation for an edge. And gamma is just a collection of edges, just things like that. I just encode it like that. So it's. Okay. 
it's just a notation. Now my goal is to rewrite g of u in terms of these quantities. So g of u, I can write it as the sum over every walk, gamma from 0 to u. But now already do not think of this as a self-forwarding walk. It is not a self-forwarding walk. It's a walk, a priori. And here, x to the gamma, k of 0 gamma of gamma. This is encoding the, uh, the repulsion, the fact that it must be self-avoiding. OK? So you see here, if you use this decomposition, you can write this g of u as a sum of every, say, n equals 0 to infinity or something like that, of any graph, possible graph, of x to the gamma product of the ust for st in the gamma. The point is that this is going to be a huge, huge sum, very, very big sum. So our goal is to only partially decompose our thing, not to decompose in a, into any graph, gamma, but to decompose into what we say any graph having a certain lace. And I'm going to tell you what a lace here is. So instead of decomposing on any graph gamma, I will decompose on every lace. And I will have the sum, I mean, hidden in my partition function that will appear next, I will have the sum of every graph for which the lace is equal to my lace L. So in order to that, I need to tell you what a lace is for a graph, and then you are going to see the thing just kind of follows almost directly. Uh, yeah, let me erase maybe this part here. So this is just a way, think of it as a smart way of decomposing my, uh, in a systematic way, my green function. So first thing, imagine I have, so definition of a lace, definition of a lace. Think of a lace as kind of the backbone of the connected component of my graph. So I'm going to tell you what a graph is, and then what is the backbone of this, uh, of this, uh, of this graph, of this con uh, sorry connected component. So imagine I give you a graph. Let me try to draw a good one. Oh, actually, this one is fairly well chosen. So let's do something that looks like that. Maybe this like that, this like that, and here, let's do that, and that. OK, let's say this is your graph. I want to define the connected components of this graph. So the connected components are going to be, well, the connected components, <laughs> simply, right? When you look at the intersections. So here I draw a set of lines that are connected components. So there are, in this case, how many? There are four of them for the following reason, because there is only one trick. So there is one here, one here. And here there are two of them. These guys here are not considered as in the same connected components. The connected components are really these things that cross each other, really cross. OK? And now for a connected component C, for the connected component of the origin, actually, so let's call C of gamma the connected component of the origin, I'm going to define the lace of gamma as follows. So the lace of gamma, the lace of C of gamma is defined as follows. It's defined recursively. So it's a set of edges. And it's kind of a minimal set of edges encoding already a lot of intersection. Think of it like that. So the first thing is to define it's A0. So A0 will be A. So A is the first, like we are looking at K of AB here. 
a is the first vertex. So a0 is equal to a. And t0, which is the other endpoint of the first edge, is equal to the farthest point connected to, uh, to, z to 0, I mean to a. So imagine you have two guys like that. So z t0 is the max of the t such that a t belongs to gamma. OK? So it's this guy. Then you define recursively ti will be the max of the t for which there exists a s smaller than t i minus 1 with s t belongs to gamma. So in this case, what is this guy? Well, this is the largest guy for which you are connected to a value which is smaller. And s i is the mean of a t of a s of the s t i mean the s for which s t i belongs to gamma so if i would have had okay maybe i could draw this one rather if i would have had several guys connected to this one i take the smallest one and the lace is just a collection of these of these edges Okay? Good. So now, what I can always write is I can write k of a, b to be simply the sum over all the possible lays of the sum for any gamma graph with w, I mean with uh, the lace of gamma equal L. So let's define the lace L of gamma of the cluster of gamma, but therefore of gamma. And then what I write, I write the product for st in L times times the product of one uh, of ust sorry of gamma of course well, ust that's maybe 1 plus ust where st belongs to what i will call compatible of gamma what is compatible of gamma it's a set of edges in gamma which are such that if you add them to your graph, you don't change the lace. So let me, so we're compatible of gamma. Gamma as a, as a set of st in gamma, such that st union the lace, when I apply the lace, I get the same. So that's the guys that would not change the definition of your lace. So let me give an example. This guy, for instance, will not change the lace, or this guy will not change the lace, for instance. OK? Let me another, give you another more important example. What am I doing? Let me not give you another example because I understand I'm not certain that's a good one. OK, so let's keep like that. So the compatible are the guys that do not change the lace. OK. OK, so now let's just use the decomposition use this, I mean this definition of lace and uh, compatible of gamma to define M maybe that's just that there actually I'm confused now 
Okay, I messed up something, but okay. So if I define k of a, b now, notice that k of a, b, there are two possibilities. Either the connected component of a is a singleton, or it's not a singleton. If it's a singleton, then k of a, b, when you decompose it using graph, you can just see that it's k of a plus 1 b. So that corresponds to the case where the first guy is connected to nobody. So what any graph like that is what? It's just a graph from a plus 1 to b. Plus the sum for s equal a plus 2 to uh, b of k of, I mean, sorry, of k of s b. And before here, well, what do you get? You get exactly, well, the sum of a lace of this thing. Notice that here, this is just minus 1 to the number of edges in L. OK. And I'm going to write it as a sum for capital N equals 0 to infinity, uh, capital N equal 1 to infinity, to minus 1 to the capital N times Gn of As. And Gn of As is what? is just this whole sum. When, so sum when uh, number of edges, I mean, this, this is this whole sum, sorry, where you restrict w for number of edges equal n in the lace. OK? So you just decompose of every laces with n edges of the sum of every, uh, every compatible edge of product of 1 plus us t. OK? Yes? If you just precise what's the nature of the lace, like it's edges. It's a set of edges. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, okay. set of edges. So it's pairs, so a lace L of uh, gamma is a set of ST. And the point is that this ST have some compatible relation, which is that basically they need to look like that. Right? That. And now I understood, sorry, so I wanted to give you other examples, sorry, and I, I got confused because I was I wanted to tell you these guys are compatible edges. These guys are actually non-compatible edges. What are the edges that are not compatible here? They are those that will change the lace if you add them. If you add this edge, you don't change the lace. If you add this edge, you don't change the, e the lace either. Why? Because this T1 is larger than this one. So T1 was this guy anyway, that you put this guy or not. But if you put this edge, you do change the lace. If you put this edge, you are, the T1 should be this guy here, right? So these two yellow edges were actually the non-compatible edges. Now notice here, morally, what does this thing say? Here I'm taking the product of a compatible edges of the 1 plus UST. So I'm saying any compatible edge I cannot have gamma s equal gamma t. It's impossible. It's forbidden. Yeah? But if st are in the graph gamma, how can they be not compatible with the lace of gamma? No. No, but you are, you are summing over every gamma here. So for a fixed lace, you are just describing the set of guys. Ah, no, no, so, uh, sorry, but... Uh, OK, now you. No, no, but they are compatible. So yeah, I mean, if you want, it's all the all the edges in, a, yeah, that's, a, I mean, I want to highlight the fact that they are compatible because then I want to kind of ignore the summation of a gamma. If you want, like that, it's indeed st incompatible gamma. Then you can just resum the whole thing 
to get only, okay, that's what you are saying and maybe that's actually a smart thing to do. So it's minus one to the L, I should have written that, sorry. Ah yeah, 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 no, no, that's, uh, that's not okay what I wrote. You're so this is UST for ST in uh, gamma minus the less. Sorry, you are entirely right, sorry. <laughs> I got confused. And now this whole thing here, you can rewrite it as some uh, minus, I mean, sum over N minus one to the N and sum over laces with number of edges equal N. And here you are going to have product of one plus UST for ST compatible. Yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. That's the whole point. I, uh, I mean, being in front of the board is making, uh, so it's exactly saying that. It's exactly saying you want to resum, you don't want to have the whole uh, entropy of all the graph. So what you do is you only decompose with respect to laces. Yeah, thank, thank you. I mean, that's, uh, okay. Is it clear now? Good. And so this guy here is a guy that I call GN. Okay. Very good. So now, when it's written like that, if I replug in J, I mean in, in the green function, what do I get? I get J of U called delta zero of u plus x sum for v neighboring u uh, zero of g of u minus v plus well sum of a v of pi of v g of u minus v where pi of v is equal to the sum of the pi n of v and pi n of v is what? Is just what you end up when you do the summation here in the green function. So pi n of v is the minus one to the n sum for gamma from zero to uh, v of x to the gamma times g n of zero gamma. Right? So what you just do, you just plug this inequality, this equality in G. So you just replace here by the term. What do you end up with? This guy is actually going to give you exactly the x times the sum of the neighbors of G of u minus x. And these guys here this will give you exactly the green function from v to u, so g of u minus v. And this term here will give you this uh, pi of v. Okay? And notice here that, well, pi of 0 is what? Uh, pi, uh, pi of 0 is nothing, sorry, so it's sum for n equal 1 to infinity. When you are on the board, it's a little bit, uh, you are close to, uh, <laughs> to, the, to your mistakes. Uh, so pi 1 of v is what? What is the only lace that you can imagine? Well, the lace necessarily go to the end of your thing, so it's, this is the only lace that you can imagine. And it is exactly the pi 1 of v that we were looking at. What are the laces with two quantities? two edges, it's exactly those ones. With three, you end up with this. So we recover the three things that we got, and in more general, you will be always able to decompose into n guys like that. It's just that when you in order to encode which edges need to be, like which ST needs to have gamma S not equal to gamma T, well, it's best seen by this systematic way if you do the right thing, if you resum the right thing. Okay. So that kind of suggests that 
there is a natural inverse. I mean, actually, it does more than suggesting. It proves that there is a natural inverse for for G. So define delta self-avoiding walk of U, and actually it's something that depends on X, to be 1 if U equals 0, minus pi, I mean, um, minus uh, X plus uh, pi of, uh, pi 1 of U if U is a neighbor of zero and pi one, I mean, uh, pi, sorry, so, and minus pi of u, if u, I mean, distance between u is larger than one, right? So it really looks, if the pi of u would all be positive, it will really be the generator of a long range uh, random walk. It's not the case, but but now the question becomes how close is this thing from Laplacian? And in order to do that, well, we need to understand how fast this term does decay. So maybe let me put an x here to really highlight that this is depending on x. So question. how close delta self-avoiding wall is from delta. And the first thing we can try to do is to bound, because, I mean, you can always write that, but it's kind of an empty statement if you are not able to work with it. So first thing we are going to do is try to bound Px of u. Okay? So, uh, what do I erase? Maybe. So, how do you de bound P of U? Well, first thing you do is P of U is smaller that the sum for n equals 0 to infinity of pi n of u, right? Up to now, no difficulty there. So the goal is to bound this guy. So what is this guy? So it's a lace with n edges like that. And what I do, I can sum on v0, which is equal to 0 which must be equal to this guy. I can sum on v1, which must be equal also there, on v2, etc., up to vn there, right? I can sum on this. Uh, how many? v0, v1, uh, yeah, uh, vn minus 1. Uh, yeah. OK, so I can say this is sum smaller than sum for n equals 0 to infinity of the sum for v1, v2, vn minus 1, and v0 equals 0. And now your work has like very complicated intersection conditions, right? Because they are all the compatible edges, you should have non-intersection. Yes? Does the sum start at 0 or 1? What's pi 0? So, here there are very complicated conditions in what is in a load to intersect what. But I'm just going to say, okay, so there are compatible edges, these compatible edges that cannot have intersection. Okay, they are complicated, but just let's just think definitely all those all those are compatible. All those between guys here are compatible. All those between guys here are compatible. So I only I at least need this 
guy to be safe overloading, this one to be safe overloading, etc., etc. So if I write like that, I get g of v0, v1 squared, then g of v0, v2, then g of v2, v1, then g of v1, v3. Uh, sorry, I did always with, uh, with this notation, etc., etc., up to this point where I get vn minus 1, vn minus 2, and vn minus 1. So I will get this squared at the very end. OK? OK. Well, assume, assume for a moment that I know that g of v, g of u, is smaller than some constant divided by u to the d minus 2. Basically, that I know that it's bounded by green function. Then here, it's a big sum, but it's an explicit sum. OK? That's something that you can all compute yourself. And what you end up with is that this whole thing here, so if, again, it's assumed that you have this bound, then this whole sum is in fact smaller than a certain constant to the n, maybe let's put c0 and this is c1, divided, I mean times divided, by u to the 3d minus 6. It's a computation. Just it's a completely elementary computation. OK. So that is problematic because you see for small u, this, I mean, for no u, this converges. Because this constant c1 is blowing up. So here is where we stop working with self avoiding work. So there is a story that allows you to prove that this sum here is convergent for d very large, for self avoiding work and d very large. It's a too complicated story for the 20 minutes that remain. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to change the model. OK? And I'm going to work, so this is not good enough for convergence. And therefore, we are going to switch to the dome joy model, so to the weekly self avoiding walk. You remember the weekly self avoiding walk was something where you don't forbid completely the existence of an intersection, you just penalize it. Okay? So imagine here how I want to rewrite this to say that I only penalize the number of intersections. Here, what do, uh, what do I mean? If I don't want to penalize at all, I put UST to just be 0, right? If I want to penalize completely, I put UST equal to minus 1 when there is an intersection. If I put minus beta here, then I penalize an intersection, but I don't forbid it. That's exactly the dome joist uh, model. So here, if you do exactly the same study, but with this UST beta instead of UST, what changes? Well, the only place that changes is that here, it's not minus 1 to the number of edges. It's minus beta to the number of edges. Right? If it's minus beta to the number of edges, all the rest was actually the same, except here, instead of getting here, I, instead of getting minus 1 to the beta times this sum, so basically this sum when you take the absolute value, you are going to get beta to the n times this sum. For beta small enough, it's convergent. So for beta very small, on a, we get convergence of the pi. And furthermore, we actually get that pi of u is smaller we call to c1 beta, basically, times 
u to the 3d minus 6. I mean, c2, maybe it's another constant, but it's something of this sort. OK? OK. So now, what is the end of the proof? Well, the end of the proof is actually not that simple, but I can try to give you an idea of how it goes. So the end of the proof is absolutely, is completely abstract. It doesn't rely on the self avoiding work anymore. And it's saying, basically, some guy which looks like that, where these are small, well, its inverse, which is exactly g, has to be close to the um, to the um, to the green function. So let me state the lemma and let's then prove the I mean finish the proof of the theorem. So the lemma that I will only sketch the proof afterwards. So this is like four point four or five something like that. We don't care anymore. I almost got it. Like almost until the end, I, I did the numbering right. So the lemma is the following. Assume d is larger or equal to 2, or actually uh, strictly larger than 2, sorry. And assume that, and consider delta such that, so you consider an operator delta which has the following properties. So delta is symmetric with respect to the symmetries of ZD. OK? And I'm going to tell you where it's, it, it's involved. The, same thing, the, same, uh, the second thing is assume that the sum of the delta of x is positive for every x. Uh, I mean, is, is positive. Okay. And last one is assume that delta of x minus delta random walk of x is smaller we call to c beta divided by x to the d plus 4. Okay? Assume these three things. Then g, which is delta minus 1, so it's the inverse of delta for the convolution, satisfies that g of x is smaller than 2g random walk, I mean g of u, sorry, I, I promise I will not make the mistake, and I, of course, did it, is smaller than twice, so, so as you know, for beta small enough, I have that. So this lemma, we are gonna, I'm going to tell you a little bit how we can prove it, but let me first tell you how you prove the theorem using this lemma. So proof of theorem 4.3 for weekly self avoiding walk, of course, since we switch to this model. And notice that here, it's going to work for any d larger or equal to 5. So fix d larger or equal to 5 and beta small enough. So here, there is a small trick, which is we did get the bound, but we only got the bound assuming we already had a bound. Right? We, we prove that the pi was small only because we assume that the green function was bounded by, I mean, that the green function for self avoiding walk was bounded by the green function for simple random walk. So it's kind of going round and round because we are trying to prove that. So, I mean, assuming it is not uh, the best thing we could do. But here is the trick, and here is the beautiful trick it's a bootstrap argument. It's kind of saying, if you are small at some point, you will never manage to get big later. So define the following. So uh, define f of x 
which is just the soup of a u of the green function of self avoiding walk divided by the green function of simple random walk. Uh, we, I mean, this is for weekly self avoiding walk now, right? So I'm, I'm going to put a beta like that, but uh, maybe I'm just going to ignore it after. Look at this function. And notice you agree that for x small, f of x is smaller than 3 or even 2. Okay, so for x small, f of x is smaller or equal to 2. Second point is here, assume that instead of doing that, I really wrote. This has exactly the right bound. If I assume that, then I get that for a certain c. OK? So now, for x small, you have that. Now, observe that f is continuous. Let's say 1 over 2d xc, but I mean, you could go from 0 to xc. xc is excluded, of course. And let's say 1 over 2d. This is smaller or equal to 2. And now, observe that, OK. Uh, sorry, that was with a 3. Now, if f of x is smaller or equal to 3, that means that the pi satisfies this bound. OK? But if pi satisfies this bound, then Delta x self avoiding walk satisfies the assumptions of the lemma. Why? Well, this thing here is going to be tautological from the bound on pi simply because 3d plus 6 is larger than d plus 4. Well, actually, let me put 3d. No, but okay. Uh, so, uh, indeed, pi of u is smaller than c1, I mean c2 beta over u to the 3d uh, to the d plus 4 since d larger or equal to 5 implies 3d plus 4 uh, 3d minus 6 larger or equal to d plus 4 okay second delta is clearly symmetric delta self avoiding walk is clearly symmetric and third point where this is positive because in fact and, and yeah this is positive because sub sum of uh, u of delta self avoiding walk of u is just one of a sum of uh, uh, i want strict sorry it's sum of a u of the green function and this is strictly positive since sum of a u of g of u is finite for any x smaller than x. OK? So you have the three assumptions of your lemma. Therefore, if you have the three assumptions of your lemma, what do you deduce? You deduce that for every u, g of u is in fact smaller than 2 g random walk of u. So what did I just prove? I, use, I proved that if f of x is smaller or equal to 3, yes? Uh, how do you, you have the last assumption, the absolute value of this? this? So delta self holding walk minus delta random walk. So the delta random walk was, ah, uh, OK, maybe uh, here you need to put um, 
Yeah, you need to put an X, that's what you are saying. Let's let's put it uh, let's put it like that. Let's put an X like that. Uh, that's what that was your concern, because you see, like uh, when you wrote like, where is it? No, no. Actually, let me keep it like that. Sorry. Um, did I erase the pi? I did erase the pi. Ah, maybe not. Maybe yes. <laughs> okay, the pi, uh, I mean, here, delta of u was minus x for the neighbors, minus the sum of the pi, I mean, minus the pi of u, sorry. So pi of u itself is bounded by that, and you just need for neighbors to check that it's true, but x is smaller, I mean, xc, when beta is small, xc is basically close to 1 over 2d, at beta, I mean, up to a certain beta factor. So here, putting, like, even for the neighbors, you also get a bound as constant times beta. But uh, you, you are right. So you have the three things. So, I mean, the key is really this one. But indeed, you need uh, this plus uh, xc minus 1 over 2d, uh, yeah, xc minus 1 over 2d, smaller than constant times beta, which you can check very easily. Okay, so you have the three assumptions of your lemma. Therefore, you just prove that f of x is smaller or equal to 2. So you have a continuous function starting at a value which is smaller or equal to 2, which is forbidden to take the value between 3 and 2. Therefore, it will always remain smaller or equal to 2. You did use the result at the end with 2. Okay? So this is a bootstrap argument that was introduced by Hara and Slade, which are two very big names. So the less expansion was introduced by Bridges and Spencer for the weekly self avoiding work. Then it was used repeatedly by many, many authors, including uh, Hara and Slade, which are the two uh, key players that did also uh, the percolation, for instance, with, um, with self avoiding work. Let me just very briefly uh, tell you, just orally, how you prove this last uh, deconvolution argument. So you have an estimate on delta, you want an estimate on the inverse of, of delta. Okay? That's the only thing that I'm not proving, basically, for a weekly safe reading book. So it's not extremely complicated to do. What you do is you, you, you want to... To, to basically, yeah, actually, <laughs> I don't know whether I can do orally that. I, mean it <laughs> I don't think it's going to work very well. But, okay, okay, let me write two or three things, uh, just keywords for the bound of the lemma. I take you five minutes, and, and like that, you, you, you at least see that I didn't, uh, I mean, that I almost did everything. Proof of the lemma. So basically, the idea is define rho to be one of a constant beta times delta self-avoiding walk minus delta random walk, but massive random walk. So what is this thing? It's one if u is equal to zero. It's zero if this, I mean, otherwise. And it's minus mu if u is a neighbor of 0. So the standard Laplacian is with mu equal 1 over 2d. This is a massive Laplacian. Okay? So define this where mu is such that sum of the rho of x is 0. Okay? You need to check that you can always find a mu like that. It's always possible, and this mu will always be smaller or equal to 1 over 2d. Okay? So, the main claim, and that's basically the only claim necessary, is the following, is that if you define the following norm, so define the norm of f, so the norm of a function is going to be the soup 
of sum of the f of x, I mean f of u, so the L1 norm, and the soup over u of u to the d f of u. So there is kind of a soup over uh, maybe d minus 2 f of u. No, uh, u to the d. So it's a soup between two norms, which is the L1 norm and the norm obtained by doing the, the soup of u to the d times f of u. So it controls the growth of f of u times u to the d, and it controls the sum of the f of u. And basically, the claim is that any row, I mean, any row satisfying this property, I mean, this row, satisfies that the norm of satisfies that the norm of the green function against, I mean, convoluted with rho is small. And this claim, the only key for this claim is a very precise estimate of these guys and of the green function. So it's a very precise, delicate, asymptotic estimate for the green function. Once you have that, it's actually very simple to, uh, to get this thing. And that's exactly where this assumption, for instance, is used because, the I mean, you use, uh, you use this very delicate asymptotic as function of the green function and you combine it with a Taylor expansion, basically. And, for instance, the symmetric allows you to kill the first derivatives, the odd derivatives. It uses this symmetry of delta. Okay. So you get something like that. And from this claim that I will not prove, but that you can see in the paper by um, Gadi Kosma, uh, Van der Hofstadt, and uh, Bolthausen, which is a very nice account on a simple way of getting uh, less expansion, which is what I presented. So I let you imagine the complicated ones. OK, so once you have this, it actually tells me that this minus this when I convolute with this thing, what do I end up with? Well, this is just C beta times rho. So if I get this bound, I get C1 times beta here. Just I multiply by C beta the bound that I get here, right? But notice that this is what? This is this thing with this thing minus delta 0, right? This, by definition, the convolution of these two guys is delta 0. So now I let you check easily that this norm gives a Banach algebra structure with the convolution. Therefore here, if you have that, you did use that this thing is invertible. It's very close to the unit. OK, it's invertible. Well, right, and, and in, in, in addition to that, you know that the reverse thing is equal to delta 0 plus a certain variable e, and e satisfies also a bound of the following type, if it's invertible in the Banach uh, algebra. OK. <coughs> Very good. So what is G now? Well, G by definition is the self-forwarding walk convoluted with G mu random walk minus 1 convoluted with G mu random walk, right? Because if you do that, these two guys are going to cancel each other. And this minus 1 is the definition of G. Or actually here, because we are in the lemma, there is no random self-forwarding walk here anywhere. It's just the delta that I chose, right? OK, but this here, I said, is delta 0 plus e. So that gives me g mu random walk plus e g mu random walk. 
right? Well, once you are here, you are done for the following reason. If you want to bound g of x, well, you say it's, I mean, g of u, you say it's smaller than g mu random walk of u. But this is clearly, because mu is smaller than 1 over 2d, this is clearly smaller than just the green function. So I end up with that. And then I need to bound here the sum of a v of e of v g of u minus v for random walk u. And here you can just check that this bound here is giving you two things. It's giving you that the average of e is not big and e is growing, is, is much smaller than 1 over u to the d everywhere. When you replug this in this thing, you just get that this is smaller or equal to constant over u to the d minus 2, constant beta. OK? So the proof of the lemma is actually, I mean, it's, it would be long to write it completely on the board, but it's kind of fairly natural. You define the right norm, and then you just check this claim, which really is based on delicate asymptotics of g. Once you have that, it's tautological almost, like it's very simple lines to use the Banach algebra structure to define the inverse, check that the inverse is just a perturbation of the, of the identity, and then write g as g mu plus uh, uh, a small uh, modification. Notice that at no point you bound g by g mu. You always bound by g. For the following reason, here you had g mu, which g mu is decaying exponentially fast if mu is smaller than 1 over 2d, right? Because it's a massive random walk, so it decays exponentially fast. So this term may be decaying exponentially fast. This one isn't. This one is always decaying like constant over u to the d minus 2. So you do not, you never get a bound by the massive one. But you get a bound by constant divided by u to the d minus 2, and this, of course, for beta small enough, ends up being smaller than uh, g random walk. That's, I mean, that's the end of the proof. It's a complicated proof, but I hope I gave you some ideas of how it was going. So you have this uh, less expansion uh, thing, and then you have this more analytical part of the proof, a little bit messier, but more generic. There is nothing really based on, on the, the model there. The tricky point is to prove the convergence of this less expansion. This point is difficult. I did it for the weakly self-avoiding walk model. For the true self-avoiding walk, you have further work to, uh, to implement. It's actually, you have a lot of work to get this thing uh, done. Well, uh, thank you for following all these lectures. And uh, well, thank you. <laughs>